I'm not really sure when this show is going to air, but I was going to talk about some of the conferences I'll be going to in the next few weeks. Of course, if, as we're expecting, these will go into reruns, the dates will have long passed anyway. But um, Halloween, this is the year 2005, the weekend of Halloween, I'll be speaking in Dayton, Ohio. They're having the Wisdom Quest conference there. And I'll be speaking there on Sunday. Now, some of these conferences, if you want more details on them, you can go on our website. And I believe there's going to be a link to logins to our website. And you click on schedules, you'll be able to see all the places I'm going to be and the different uh, schedule. But after the one in Dayton at Halloween, the next weekend, which is the first weekend of November, See, it's going to be the 5th and the 6th. I will be at Minneapolis at Big Expo there, the Edge Expo in Minneapolis, and I'll be speaking there. Both of these places, I'm going to be speaking about the New Earth. Now, eventually, as we do these shows, I'll be speaking about all of these different types of information that are contained in the book. Right now, because the Convoluted Universe uh, Book 2 has come out, this is the subject they want me to speak at at the different lectures. But that will be the next two weeks going into November. Then the week after that, I'm going overseas again. I do a lot of work out of the country now. It seems like I'm on the plane going to these other overseas countries more than I'm doing conferences here in the United States. Uh, the 11th of November, I'll be heading to the Middle East. I was supposed to do a huge international conference in Istanbul. This was big because they, this was one of those where they say they translate to everyone in the audience through earphones uh, in their own language, just like they do in the UN. And it was going to be very big. But at the last minute, it was canceled because some of the speakers in the United States, and I won't mention their names, but some of them are very, uh, very important speakers, are ill, and so they had to cancel the conference at the last minute. Well, that kind of messed up the rest of my trip. They're going to reschedule for next year, and I'm going to hope that I can work it into my schedule at that time, but who knows. But anyway, on the same trip, I've been asked to go to Dubai. So we were working it into the same trip. Well, the trip to Dubai is still on, and that's where I'll be going the 11th of November, and I'll be gone for about 10 days doing lectures, workshops, and one of my hypnosis classes in Dubai. And when they first had told me I was going to Dubai, I said, where in the world is that? Well, I went on the Internet to find out, and oh boy, it's Saudi Arabia on one side, and Iran and Iraq on the other side, and it sits right on the Persian Gulf. And I was thinking, I don't know if this is where I want to be not with everything that's going on over there. But they said it's uh, a part of the area that is called the United Arab Emirates, and it's a neutral country. That means it's not involved in any of the friction and the things that are going on in the other countries around it, in the, in the Arabian uh, countries. And uh, they've told me that it's neutral and it's safe to go there and I shouldn't have any problem. There are a lot of expatriates there. Those are former English citizens that live there. And they said they were starving for information, especially about the New Age metaphysical topics. So they wanted to know if I could come and uh, talk about some of my books. And I said, while I was there, I might as well go ahead and give one of my classes because they are growing everywhere. And they said, other people, they all speak English. So I shouldn't have any problem. Interesting thing I found out about Dubai, they said as little as 30 years ago in the 1970s, it was just desert communities. And they made their living with pearl fish fishing off of the uh, Persian Gulf. But suddenly, in just the one generation, it has turned into one of the richest countries in the world. And it's a tremendous city. They said it is so large now, huge buildings. 
and that in one generation it has turned from a desert community to one of the richest uh, places in the world. One of their things they're talking about is in March they have the richest horse race ever in the anywhere in the world. So I'm going to be going into a, a place that's different that I've never been before. So you can be sure that when I get back, I will uh, tell everyone what kind of a trip it was. They said my workshop's going to be held uh, in a villa out in the desert. So we'll see what happens. But uh, to me, this is exciting because I'm always being asked to go to more and more different places everywhere. Last May, in the month of May, I spent the entire country, uh, the entire month in Europe. I always go back to England at least once a year. I have a big following there, and I do a lot of talks there. So I was in England, and I usually go to Spain because they translate one of my books every year. I have a wonderful publisher there. But uh, this time in May, I went to Norway for the first time, a beautiful country. It's one of the cleanest countries I've been to. And the remarkable thing about it was it had such crystal crisp air there. And it was like there was no pollution. The sky was so beautiful. And everything just seemed to be so clean. So it was a really a very nice place. But on this same trip, I got to go to more places that I had not been before. I went to the Ukraine, to Kiev, the capital of the Ukraine, because that's where my Russian publisher has his main office. My books are now in Russian, so uh, I've had to go there. And from uh, Kiev, I went to Moscow for the first time, and that is where my publisher has his branch office in Moscow. My books are now in about 20 different languages. This is one of the reasons why I travel constantly all over the world. You have to go to these places and lecture where they are, um, the, the books are available. And uh, they are going to uh, translate more of my books, so I'll be going back to Moscow and the Ukraine next March. We're already planning another month-long trip out of the country, and that's going to be interesting, too, because in March I'll be speaking at an international conference in New Delhi, India, and at that time I will be able to do a tour of the Taj Mahal. So we try to get some sightseeing and some fun in with these trips anyway. But uh, one thing that's interesting, when I do these uh, lectures and workshops out of the United States in these countries where you have to use translators, uh, I've gotten used to the translations of the lectures because uh, it's a little time-consuming because you say one sentence and they repeat it after you and back and forth. They wanted me to do my group regression hypnosis workshops in um, these countries. The first time they wanted me to do it was in Spain, and I said, I don't know. When I do a group regression, I put the entire room under at one time. And uh, I've done this with the, the most, it's been about 75 people. Well, I've done it with, oh, 20, 25, 30 is usually the average. And when you do a group regression, everyone is laying on the floor with their pillows, and I put everybody under at the same time. And uh, I take them into past lives. I take them to meet their guardian angels and get messages, and then I take them into the future. And it's a very popular workshop, and everybody always loves it. But I didn't know, would it work with a translator involved? because I'm so used to just talking and them listening to my voice. The translator, I thought it may be distracting, so I didn't know how it was going to work. So when I was in Barcelona, I told them, I said, this is an experiment. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I will try it. And amazingly, it worked beautifully. I told him, those of you who understand English, listen to me. The ones that understand Spanish, listen to the translator. But it worked beautifully, and we had the same results that I've had in any English-speaking country. And then last May, we did it with a translator in Norway, 
and then one in the Ukraine and in Russia. It worked every time. Something strange happened, though, when I was in Kiev um, when we were doing this. Uh, my wife, the wife of my publisher, was in one of the ones participating. Now these people don't speak; they speak very, very limited English. Uh, she didn't speak any, and um, so they would have to listen to the translator in order to know the instructions as I guide them through the group regression. Well, afterwards, uh, she was telling me through the interpreter that she was becoming angry because. She said the young man who was doing the translating was distracting. She wanted to listen to me and my instructions, and he was distracting her. But I said, but you don't understand English. She said, I know, but something very strange was happening. While I was listening to you, I knew what you were saying, and I knew what to do, and I saw the pictures in my mind, and I got the same results. And even the interpreter said during one of the breaks, he said, they aren't listening to me, they're listening to you. Now, how can this be happening unless we're using a different part of the mind that seems to do what? Understand communication, be able to pick up on these things? Of course, in my work, there's so many strange things happen that I wonder why I even question it after a while. But it was strange to think they could understand and follow me without knowing English. So this is interesting. But when I do this in Dubai, they said, don't worry about it. They all speak English, and we're not going to have to use a translator. But it's like everywhere I go, there's more and more adventures, and kings keep happening. <laughs> So I wanted to bring that up anyway because I will be traveling and I'm trying to get as many uh, programs taped so they can be played while I'm gone. Then when I get back, I'll be back to trying to do one a week, which will make it a little easier on me. But right now I'm still in the beginning stages of giving the background, as I did last week, of what I do. And later I'll be talking about the different books and the information in the books. Then, as we go along, I have many, many other authors that my company has published in the metaphysical field. And we're going to see if we can do interviews with them and um, talk to them. And get, you can meet all of these people and be exposed to their wisdom and the things that they have uncovered that we have decided to publish. Uh, my company is Ozark Mountain Publishing. And I founded it in 1991, so we've been at it for quite a ways time now. But in the beginning, when I was first writing my books, I went the route of every other author. I had all of the things that could possibly happen to an author happen to me. I had uh, my manuscripts were accepted many, many times, and at one time the publisher was almost killed and ended up in a hospital, and his whole publishing company went down the drain. Every time something would happen, I'd have to start all over again, and with the sending it out, submitting it, and everybody was always interested, but something always interfered. In the beginning, one uh, publisher said, uh, that was in the early days when no one knew anything about reincarnation, about past life regression. They said, now, if you were hypnotizing somebody famous, like a movie star or something, and writing about that, maybe it would be interesting and we could get somebody to read it. He was going for the big publishers. But as it is, you're not uh, you're working with someone famous. So... He didn't know if he could get anyone to even look at it because he said it was good, but how do we get somebody to look at it? It was a catch-22. And I think a lot of people can identify that if they started out when I did. I was submitting these things in the 80s, and there weren't any New Age stores in the regular bookstores. They had like one shelf of New Age products. There just wasn't anything out there. So I guess... I was ahead of my time. 
and some of the first books that I was submitting, my first one was the one I told last week about my beginnings, which has never been published. It was accepted several times, but it just wasn't time for it. The other one that I kept sending out was my Jesus books, and I'll be speaking about those in the weeks to come also, about the what I, information I found out about the missing years and the parts that are not mentioned in the Bible. I have a great deal of information. We'll be covering a lot of these things. But um, other publishers that I sent my work to, uh, another one said um, they had been bought out by another company and 400 employees lost their jobs, so everything was coming to a standstill. They weren't even sure if they could publish the ones they had. So sometimes when you're an aspiring writer, even when you find somebody who wants to publish it, it's not that easy. I went the route to find this out, and I had absolutely everything that could possibly go wrong with a, pub, with a writer I had happen. I even went the route of having an agent, and that didn't work either. He, he said the same thing. He couldn't get anyone to look at it because I was a nobody. And how do you become a somebody until you get published? Here again, it's a catch-22. But every time this would happen, one of the times, on the same day that I, they had taken me on like Cinderella at the ball, telling me everything was wonderful, it was going to be printed, it was just, uh, you know, it was going to be a bestseller, et cetera, et cetera. And on that same day that they sent me a letter saying they couldn't get anyone to look at it, my husband had a heart attack that day, and it was like everything was going wrong. Every time this would happen, I had to go back to the beginning and start all over again. I'm saying this so that those writers out there will understand it isn't that easy. It's not that easy to get your foot in the door to make a beginning on any of this. You have to believe in what you're doing. I always tell people when I speak at writers' conferences, if you really believe in what you are doing and you stick with it, sooner or later somebody else is going to believe in it too. And then you'll be all right. But you, because if you give up, then you'll never know if you would have succeeded. It is very difficult. This is a very hard business. And in the beginning, the large publishers. But every time something would happen, and I would get the rejections, and it was back to the square one to start all over again, it was so hard. And there were times I just felt like just throwing all the manuscripts against the wall and just saying, I just can't do it anymore. It hurts too much. But then I started thinking, what else did I want to do? Was there anything else I wanted to do with my life? I said last week in the, the last show, my kids were grown. They were leaving home. And I was taking care of my husband in a wheelchair, but still, I didn't have anything for me except my writing and my creativity and the hypnosis. If I stopped, where would I be? And I kept saying, no, I can't. I want to write. Even though it's not getting published, it's not going anywhere, it was a compulsion. It was something that I had to do. And then I would sit down and start another book, <laughs> not knowing if it was ever going to go anywhere, not knowing if it would ever be published, but just because I had to do it. It was a compulsion. It got to the point that I would rather write than eat. I would be fixing supper, and suddenly I would get an idea, and I would just drop the potatoes in the sink and go down to the typewriter. It was a typewriter in those early days. I wrote my first five books on a typewriter. And I had to get the information down quickly before it got out of my head. And when I was driving in a car, I would have a notebook in the car, constantly making notes, pulling over to the side of the road and making notes on things that would pop into my mind. And people, at, especially at writers' conferences, are always asking me, how do you start writing? How do you finish your book? 
you have to want to write more than you want to eat. It has to be such a compulsion that you cannot not write. That is what makes a writer. If you find something else to do, something else to take up the time, oh, I've got to wash the dishes, I've got to iron the clothes, or et cetera, et cetera. If you let your mundane life get in the way, you will never be a writer. If you say, well, I have uh, work to do, I'm working outside the home, or all the millions of other excuses we can come up with, then you will never be a writer. It has to be an overwhelming, overpowering compulsion. Then it will happen. And you must believe in yourself. You have to have faith. I say faith is believing in something you cannot see. Even though there's no proof it will ever happen, you just know it, you believe it, and you go on with it. That is what makes it happen. I've given lectures on creating your own reality, and you must know what you want. People say, well, I want this or that. Well, it's vague. You have to know in the tiniest detail exactly what it is you want. Because it's the law of the universe, you can create anything that you want in your life. This is the law of the universe. You can have it because we are creators. We can create it out of thought. But once you do it and send it out, you must know exactly what you want. I tell people to fill it full of lots and lots of detail. This makes it become more and more real. As you visualize what you want, you have to be able to hear people saying things. You have to be able to see the pictures to be able to make it become real. And when you do that, it will become real because it is a law of the universe that these things have to happen. But if you're vague about it, you're going to get anything because they don't know exactly what it is that you want. But then there's another thing to this, too. Once it comes to you, once you have created it, and once it has come into your life, you have a great responsibility. You have to accept that. You can't just suddenly say, well, I don't know if I want it now, or maybe this isn't exactly what I want, and figure you can send it back. It's the same thing as having a baby. You can't suddenly say, well, I don't know if I want it. You can't just undo it you can't turn it around so once you have created something you have a great responsibility to that that is when you must take care of it you have to have a responsibility to carry it on this is one of the reasons i thought mine took so long in materializing it was my testing time a time when I could have changed my mind at any time and said, well, okay, this is I don't know if I can handle not even really knowing what all was going to happen. I didn't know whether I could handle what was going to come or not. Maybe the powers that be knew more than I did. They knew it was going to take time. Another thing, too, is that the world had to catch up. By the time my first books were published, then there were New Age stores. There was another you know, increased um, awareness of metaphysics to where it happened at the right time. Everything has to happen in its correct time, especially when you create something. And the universe knows this time. In the early days, when I was trying to get my books published, and as I said, I kept writing more and more, I had to keep doing it. I know now I was putting a great deal of energy into it. It took nine years to get to find the first publisher. And some people say, well, I don't want to wait that long. I don't even want to wait two months. We have manuscripts submitted to us now all the time, and sometimes the person will say, we tell them it has to be six months before we can even look at the book because we have so many manuscripts, and this is standard for the industry to take six months before you can even look at it and get back with the uh, the writer. We get letters from people, and they'll say, I'm not going to want to wait no six months. My baby is ready to be born now. 
I said, well, tough, this is the way it goes. And you have to be prepared to wait and have patience. Everything has to happen in its own time. But in the beginning of all of this, I knew about creating your reality. My one daughter wanted to be a nurse, and she found it very discouraging and very difficult. She was in nursing school. It's like, I don't know if I'm ever going to do it. Is it ever going to happen? I told her to visualize herself in the hospital, wearing the uniform, walking down the hall, doing all the things that a nurse does with the shits. And then it will happen. You see the end result. You never worry about how it's going to happen, all the steps in between, because that limits it. Because when you create something, it will happen in ways you could never imagine. It will happen totally opposite from what you could possibly have ever thought about. So if you're trying to think, I have to do this and this and this to make this happen, you are wasting your energy and you are limiting it to saying this is the only way it can happen. This is the only route that it can take. So when you want to create something, you think about the end result, what it is that you want, the goal you want. Whatever it is you want to create, you think about it as already being done. You see it as happening. You see it as real. And then it must happen because it's the law of the universe. And the things that have happened to me have been totally against anything I could have ever imagined to make it happen. So once you give it to them, and I think you understand who I mean by them, your guides, guardian angels, the ones who work with you, they will take it and run with it, and it will happen in ways you can never imagine. They said, they told me one time, and you're going to get used to me saying they said because I get a lot of my information through the people that I work with, but they said the more difficult the project is to achieve, the longer it will take because it has to go through so many different people and different channels to make it create and become a reality. But in the very beginning, when I was wanting to create this, I kept seeing my books in the bookstores. I saw them on the shelves. I especially saw places like Borders and Barnes & Noble in the mall, and every time I would go by there, I would visualize my books being on the shelves of the store. And when I was visualizing this end product at my house, I would think, see it as already done, and the books were sitting on the shelf. And I would hear people talking. I would see them go up and pick the books up, take them up to the checkout stand, and uh, pay for them. I was putting reality into it. I was putting energy into it and life into it because the books were not published, but I saw it as an end result. And as I went about sending this out to all the different people, incidentally, in the meantime, I was busy writing. I was writing articles for, I had a weekly article for the newspaper. I was writing uh, magazine articles and sending them off. I was paying my dues as a writer, learning about writing and the mechanics of writing, going to writers' conferences. I was doing all these things that it takes to make yourself become a writer. Nothing will happen sitting at home in your chair. You have to put the energy into anything in order to create it. This is the way the energy works. Well, anyway, as I kept visualizing this, uh, he's in the bookstores, and I was going about sending it out to many different places, my daughter came home one day, and she said she had been in a New Age bookstore that she likes to go to. And just looking on the shelves at the books, on this one shelf above uh, what she was looking at, she said she saw three books sitting there. And nonchalantly, she just said, oh, those are Mama's books. And then she looked away. Then she realized what she had said. 
published because the books weren't published. It was just a spontaneous remark. Oh, those are Mama's books. But then she looked back at the shelf. The shelf was empty. There weren't any books sitting there. Well, when she told me this, I knew what was happening. I think you can realize it, too. This meant the books were beginning to become solid. They were beginning to materialize. They were beginning to come into our dimension. They were beginning to become a reality. They were real enough that somebody could see them. So this meant it was happening and it was going to happen. So I knew then, there was no doubt in my mind, that the books would be published. And uh, at that time, after nine years, I had my first publisher. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of that because it turned out to be a bad experience. But I found out even bad experiences have their places because my first two books to be published were the first two volumes of Nostradamus. They were published in 1989. Now, once I'd made this commitment, you know, there was no way going back on then, and it became a very exciting reality. The books, it was very important that they came out in 1989 because they contain the most accurate interpretation of the Nostradamus prophecies that have ever been written. And by coming out in 89, they came out before the events began to happen. You can say anything after the fact. But they were out before the events began to happen, so it was validation. Even today, after they've gone through, oh, ten reprints, people will say, look at the original copyright date, and you'll see these were out before the events began to happen. So this first publisher had his role to play. He had his part to play in the whole scenario, and it was a learning experience for me. And it ended up then, in 1991, I formed my own company to keep the books from disappearing and from, uh, you know, from just going into non-existence. I formed my own company, and I did many things at that time that people say were absolutely impossible for a writer to do. But I know I had help from the other side. <laughs> And this is the way things go when you believe and you know you can create. But another unusual thing did happen after Volume 1 came out. I got a letter from a woman who said she was in the bookstore, and on the bookstore she saw Volume 1 and Volume 2 of the Nostradamus. These are the books called Conversations with Nostradamus. And they are now a three-volume set. But... She saw Volume 1 and Volume 2 on the shelf. She picked them both up, carried them up to the cashier, and was going to buy them. Then she decided, well, I'll get Volume 1 today, and I'll come back later and get Volume 2. So she put Volume 2 back up on the shelf. Then she went back the next week to get Volume 2, and they told it wasn't there, and they told her it's not been published. So she wrote to me and wanted to know what was happening. Did the government decide to take these books off of the shelves and out of print or what? Because she knew it was real. She'd held it in her hand. And <laughs> I wrote her back and told her, no, I know what's happening. I said, because I was in the process of writing the book, it was not finished yet and had not gone to the printer, but I told her about the first example of my daughter seeing the books in the bookstore before they were printed, and I told her, that is what's happening. You're seeing it. It's becoming a reality, even though it wasn't finished yet and it was not printed. This is a, an example of how we do move in and out between these different dimensions. And as we go along on these shows, I'll be talking a lot. My new books, I go into a lot about other dimensions and our exposure to these different realities. But that, that story really made me think, and I've asked this at a lot of my lectures, the, it was real. The woman held it in her hand. What would have happened if she had uh, bought it and taken it home with her? Would it have disappeared when she got home? 
someone said maybe she would find that she had bought something else. I think it would really have messed up the store's inventory if they was a book that they didn't really have in the store. But what would have happened? Could she have done it? Could she have taken it home, or would it have disappeared along the way? I don't know, but she definitely held it in her hand. I've had another man wrote and told me he saw uh, books in a catalog and was going to order them before they were published. And then he went back to find the catalog, and they were not in there, so he couldn't order them because they hadn't been published yet. There's so many strange things out there. We are interacting all the time with these things. And the people who tell me these things can't probably happen and can't be real, I wonder where is the magic in their lives? Because I'm involved in so much of these strange and unusual that to me they're very, very real. I know these things happen. I'm constantly interacting with them. So if these things are happening to you, don't let people think you're crazy or say you're crazy because they are happening and more and more now. It seems now as we're going into the raising of the vibrations and the raising of the frequencies as we go into the new dimensions, the veil is becoming thinner and thinner and more and more people are, I should say, seeing behind the veil. We are... Uh, having more of these unusual experiences that we can't explain because the veil is becoming thinner. I get hundreds and hundreds of emails and calls and letters, and people are always telling me that um, they say, I ha want to tell you this, but it's people who think I'm crazy. And they said, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know who to tell my story because everybody's going to think I'm crazy. And I say, said, I've read your books. You're the only one that I can talk to. And then they'll tell me a story that I've probably heard many times before. But wherever they're living, there's nobody they can talk to. Nobody has ever had these things, and they say they're crazy. Believe me, the things I've heard, they're not crazy. It just means we're operating on a different frequency, I guess you would say. We're closer to these things. They are happening to many, many people all over the world. And they're not that unique. It's Sometimes I think the people these things are happening to are more normal than the so-called normal people out there. But... Uh, I've heard so many of the same stories over and over again about strange happenings that I do know these things are real. But anyway, then I formed my own company, and uh, I'm now publishing many, many other authors because we've been in business since 1991. And one of our authors is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. I was very honored to be able to publish his book about his uh, grandmother and grandfather. And uh, I'm involved with people just everywhere. And we have many other wonderful authors that I'll be interviewing in the days to come. I just thought of something. Someone just called me the other day at this conference we're going to be going to. He said he was reading the new book, The Convoluted Universe, Book Two. And he was reading it to him and his wife. He said they lay in bed at night reading to each other. And they were toward the end of the book. And he said he came across a piece of information that he had never heard before. And uh, he said it was talking about the solar activity on the sun and how this was being influenced by the mass consciousness of the people on Earth. And I was thinking, well, I don't remember those exact words. I do remember talking earlier in the book about the sun and the planets, but I didn't remember those exact words. But he said it was in the end of the book, the last uh, few pages. It impressed him. Anyway, he said the next day, he went back to the book to see if he could find it again, and it wasn't there. 
Now, other people have told me they've gotten things out of my books that I haven't written. And they, the guides, the guardians, the ones who come through the people I work with, said there is much more in your books than you can possibly imagine. There are things between the lines. There's information there that people get without really reading it. It goes into their their mind. I don't know if this is what they meant or what, but (laughs) there's another case of something very strange happening, and uh, how can I doubt it? Because I know these many different strange things do happen when people read my books and are around them. I don't know, whatever. But what he had read in the book wasn't there. He said, did I slip into another dimension for that time? Or was I maybe reading the ending of your next book, book three of the Convoluted Universe series? And I said, who's to say? (laughs) Because I have enough information for the book three of the series. I just haven't begun to put it together yet. So who's to say? There's many strange things out here that we don't know. And we don't have any way of knowing about any of these things. So it's just part of the excitement with it. Now, how in the world can people not have magic in their lives? There is so much around us, everything, that uh, I just keep looking for more and more. I know there's more. There's more to come. I've been told that in the beginning, it was I was given what I could take. When I began on this journey 30 years ago with the past life regressions, and then I began writing my books, I was given all that I could handle. You're being spoon-fed. The material I'm getting now, I would never have understood when I began 30 years ago. It had to be done gently and steadily. You have to be spoon-fed one little piece of information at a time. Then when you digest that piece of information, you get more. And it just keeps going along that until you can digest it. If you can't digest it, then you just wait until it's time, or you may stop and decide this is not for me. But you get little pieces as you go along. One example that was given to me just a few months ago, I had a man who came for a session, and he said one of the things he wanted to know was his purpose. This is the Main thing, that question that I get from every client I have, and I've done thousands and thousands of clients, the, one of the main things they always want to know is what is my purpose. The USA Today did a poll, and in that poll uh, they asked the normal people, I guess you would call them out there on the street, these are not the metaphysical people, they asked the normal people, everyday people, if you had access to a supreme power, what would you ask? The number one question they got in the poll was, why am I here and what am I supposed to be doing? So everyone wants to know that. What is their purpose? Why am I here? So I get this continually through every client that comes in. This man wanted to know this. Well, during the session, He was told that it was not time. And I tell people that sometimes it's not time for you to know what you're supposed to do. He said, suppose you were told you were supposed to be doing something with your life. It was 180 degrees from what you're doing now. It would be so totally different, so outrageous to you that you would say, oh, no, that's the last thing I would ever want to do. Then you would put blocks in your way. You would sabotage yourself to where you wouldn't do it. And uh, that is the reason why it's better that you don't know too soon. Now, when it's time, then you can find out. But this man, he was told it was not time. And (laughs) they give a very interesting example. They say, He is where you were 20 years ago. 
he couldn't have understood his purpose or these these things they are now just like you couldn't understand it back then they said consider it like a baby a baby has to begin with milk then with cereal then with strained carrots you can't give a baby a three course steak dinner all at one time it just it just won't happen you have to take it step by step very gently Otherwise, it's too overwhelming. It just goes over your head, and you just say, I don't understand it, and you don't even try. Then it's, it's a waste. Why? Why would you want to do that? They are, are much wiser than we can imagine. That's why they didn't give me the difficult information in the beginning. What I'm getting now, I still don't know if I can understand it, but I'm getting more and more, and... I don't really try to understand a lot of it. I said my role in all of this is to be the reporter, the investigator, the researcher of lost knowledge. I try to get back knowledge that has been forgotten, lost, or never known in the first place. And that's what I try to write about and try to get out to the people. This kind of information and often, I don't understand it. I just do my job as a reporter, write about it, and let somebody else try to figure it out and to put it into place. So that's what my job is, to try to get this information. They have told me, through many of my clients, they said, you will never have the answers to all of your questions. Some of them cannot be answered. They said some knowledge is as poison rather than medicine. That if we were to give you the knowledge at the wrong time or too soon or too much, it would have a detrimental effect on the person because they would not be able to handle it. It would be overwhelming. This is why it has to be done gently, safely, and easily to the person to give them what they can handle at that time in their life. So they said a lot of the questions, we will never be allowed to have it all. We cannot comprehend the entire story. It is just too big, too much. They said it's not the problem with the brain, it is the problem with the mind. The mind has no concepts for the things the way they really are. It cannot comprehend it because there's nothing there to hold on. There's nothing there to give an example. So in, ca in these cases, they said you will never understand it as long as you're alive. And many times during the sessions, they're trying to explain things. They will take the concepts and the vocabulary from the person I'm working with, and they will try to explain it to me as best they can. And they'll say, there isn't any concepts, there's no words, it's just impossible. Then I always ask them for some kind of an analogy, a, an example, or you might even say like a parable, some kind of an example that I can use. And when I do that, they will give me examples, but they said these are very poor representations of the way it really is. So I try to write my books in a way that people can understand and try to grasp what they're saying. Even if I don't understand it, I'm doing my job as a reporter and putting it down as simply as I can because some of these books, especially the Convoluted Universe series, I said are for people who want their minds bent like pretzels <laughs> if they want to think. My books are intended to make people think, even if they don't agree with me, if they don't like what I write about, it's to make people think and ask questions. You will never find negativity in my books. I have just not found that. I found the positive. I found the answers to many, many things because I am so full of questions. I have an insatiable curiosity. I want to know about everything. 
So I continued to ask more and more questions. But I, I know I'm not ever going to get it all, but this is what I do. And you may not agree with them, but I have not found the negativity, and I don't want to be in the negative. My work is in the light, and it is to help people realize what it's really all about, that everything is based on love, and this is what makes everything operate, the world, the universe, everything back to God, and God is love. This is what Jesus was trying to tell people. If there was love, there would be no violence in the world. There would be no wars or hatred. But they didn't understand. But I'm very much involved in history and the way it really was. So I'll be talking on some of my uh, lectures here (laughs) about the different information I've found as I go through this. Because I ask so many questions. This is what I want to know. And these are the things that I want to find out about. Um, This was not what I intended to talk about today, but sometimes things have a way of going on their own, and I just go with it. But um, those of you out there, if you are interested in having private sessions, I used to do them when I was on the road and I was lecturing at different cities. And then uh, it just got too much because I have such a huge waiting list for people. Because I was only in a city for a few days, I couldn't see more than a few people at a time. So I opened an office here in Huntsville, Arkansas, and I'm seeing clients here now when I'm home because I do travel a lot and I never know for sure when I'm going to be here, but my office knows. So if anyone is interested in a session, you can contact us through our website or through uh, our email. The email is D-E-C-A-N-N-O-N D-E-C-A-N-N-O-N, at msn.com. And we'll try to work with you to set up a session if this is what you want. Also, if anyone is interested in taking my classes, I am teaching my unique technique of hypnosis that I've developed myself. It is something I've developed that you can contact the subconscious mind directly and you can get huge amounts of information. And I am teaching this class now and it's a three-day class. We are listing these things on our website under schedules. If you check under schedules on our website, you'll see everywhere I'm going to be and where the classes are going to be. If you're interested in the class, you can also contact us either through our website or with D-E Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N, at msn.com. The ones who take the class must be qualified hypnotists. I don't start at the beginning. I don't go through the basics. I want people to at least have the basic knowledge of hypnosis before they can understand what I am teaching. And I want them to at least be working with people for a year. I have taught some people who work with imagery. This is part of their basic work when they deal with imagery and the trance-like levels. If this is what you do, you can contact us. We can see if you are qualified. But um, if you're interested in the class, you can contact us, and we'll give you more information about that. Anyone who's interested in the books or any more information about us, you can contact us with our, our 1-800 number, one 800 935 Zero zero four five one eight hundred nine three five zero zero four five. 935 Or you can contact us on our website, or you can find out everything about all the books and everything on the website. The website is www.ozarkmountain. The name of my company is Ozark Mountain Publishing. 
So the, the uh, website is abbreviated, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com, the abbreviation for mountain, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Right, and um, I think that's all we're going to have time for today. But if you want any information about the sessions, the classes, or the books, these are the three ways you can contact us. All right. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.